Well, hello there, and welcome to the Cory Doctor podcast. Um, for the first time in nearly a year, I will not be reading to you from my novel, Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town, because I'm done. Uh, that was 36 installments, finished it last week. Thank you very much to John Taylor Williams for the remastering uh, and for the production assistance. And now it's out and it's done. So I'm going to be reading other stuff this week. I'll tell you what in just a minute. Uh, it has been a crazy day. I was away all last week. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, I was in Oslo. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I was in Ottawa. Just cities that start with O's last week. Uh, and I got back on Saturday morning in time to make breakfast for the family and go out to the zoo. And uh, then to spend Sunday, again, seeing family and also some colleagues. We, we had uh, Ellen Kushner and Delia Sherman, the fantasy writers, in. So it was, a, it was a very good but very tiring weekend, and I am a very good but very tired Corey. And when I came back to my desk, I found myself with just a mountain of paperwork. It is now 4.18 in the afternoon, and about five minutes ago, I finished writing, which I started doing about 40 minutes ago. So from 5 when I got up this morning until about 3.30 in the afternoon, I did nothing but administrative stuff. Um, fix software problems, uh, chased after people who owed me money, shouted at the bank because they hadn't cleared some checks, um, went through a huge mountain of correspondence, and just generally kind of didn't get any work done. Which is funny, because of course that's all work, but it's not the work that I care about. And uh, it's it's one of those things. It's um, I, I count myself lucky because most of the time I don't have to do that. Um, many of my colleagues and peers who still have day jobs find that most of their working life is taken up with administrative work, and just a tiny fraction of it gets to go into uh, into creative work or the work that they love to do. And I find that on almost every day it's the reverse, except today. Today was very administrative heavy. Um, so For the Win, the uh, edit of For the Win is now in full swing. That's the novel I've been working on for uh, almost a year. Well, actually more than a year if you count the research swing. Um, and uh, I uh, finished on August the 31st and turned in just on time. So we're now in deep edit mode, and that's going very well. Now on to the story that I'm going to read to you today. This is a story called Epoch, and it's a story from my forthcoming collection, With a Little Help. Uh, this is the collection that um, will be self-published through lulu.com. And this story in particular was commissioned by Mark Shuttleworth, the, uh, the guy behind the Ubuntu project. Um, and uh, he asked me to write a story that was about the shutting down of the first AI and to have it be something about the Unix rollover. So that's what this story is. It was a good brief, actually. I'm having a lot of fun writing it, as I think I mentioned in the last podcast. So I'm going to read you the first couple thousand words. It's not done yet. Um, I'll probably lag myself by a few thousand words every week, and uh, I'll read you this thing as it goes, and we'll find out how it ends together. Epoch by Cory Doctorow the doomed rogue AI is called Big Mac, and he is my responsibility. Not my responsibility as in, I am the creator of Big Mac, responsible for his existence on this planet. That honor belongs to the long-departed Dr. Shannon, one of the shining lights of the once great Sun Oracle Institute for Advanced Studies, and he had been dead for several years before I even started here as a sysadmin. No, Big Mac is my responsibility, as in I, Odell Vifus, and the system's administrator responsible for his care, feeding, and eventual euthanizing. Truth be told, I'd rather be Dr. Shannon, except for the being dead part. I may be a lowly grunt, but I'm smart enough to know that being the man who gave the world AI is better than being the kid who killed it. Not that anyone would care, really. 115 years after Mary Shelley first started humanity's hands wringing over the possibility that we would create a machine as smart as us, but out of our control, Dr. Shannon did it. And it turned out to be incredibly, utterly boring. Big Mac played chess as well as the non-self-aware computers, but he could muster some passable trash talk while he beat you. Big Mac could trade banalities all day long with any Turing tester who wanted to waste a day chatting with an AI. Big Mac could solve some pretty cool vision system problems that had eluded us for a long time, 
and he wasn't a bad UI for a search engine, but the incremental benefit over non-aware, non-self-aware vision systems and UIs was pretty slender. There just weren't any killer apps for AI. By the time Big Mac came under my care, he was less a marvel of the 21st century and more a techno-historical curiosity who formed the punchline to lots of jokes, but otherwise performed no useful service to humanity in exchange for the useful services that humanity, e.g. me, rendered to him. I had known for six months that I'd be decommissioning old BM, as I like to call him behind his back, but I hadn't seen any reason to let him in on the gag. Luckily for all of us, Big Mac figured it out for himself and took steps in accord with his nature. This is the story of Big Mac's extraordinary self-preservation program, and the story of how I came to love him, and the story of how he came to die. My name is Odell Vifus. I am a third-generation systems administrator. I am 25 years old. I have always been sentimental about technology. I have always been an anthropomizer of computers. It's an occupational hazard. Big Mac thought I was crazy to be worrying about the rollover. It's just Y2K all over again, he said. He had a good voice. Speech synthesis was solved long before he came along. But it had odd inflections that meant you never forgot you were talking with a non-human. You weren't even around for Y2K, I said. Neither was I. The only thing anyone remembers about it today is that it all blew over. But no one can tell at this distance why it blew over. Maybe all that maintenance tipped the balance. Big Mac blew a huge load of IPv4 ICMP traffic across the network, stuff that the firewalls were supposed to keep out of the system, and every single intrusion alarm system lit, making my screen into a momentary mosaic of competing alerts. It was his version of a Raspberry, and I had to admit it was pretty imaginative, especially since the IDSs were self-modifying and required that he come up with new and better ways of alarming them each time. Odell, he said, the fact is, almost everything is broken almost always. If the failure rate of the most vital systems in the world went up by 20%, it would just mean some overtime for a few maintenance coders, not Gutterdammerung. Trust me, I know, I'm a computer. The rollover was one of those incredibly boring apocalypses that periodically got extracted by the relevance filters, spun into screaming 128-point link-bait headlines, then dissolved back into their fundamental, incontrovertible technical dullness and out of the public consciousness. Rollover, September 30th, 2034. The day that the Unix time function would run out of headroom and roll back to zero, or do something else undefined. Oh, not your modern Unices. Not even your elderly Unices. To find a rollover vulnerable machine, you needed to find something running on an elderly 32-bit Paleo Unix, a machine running on a processor that was at least 20 years old, 2014 being the last date that a 32-bit processor shipped from any major fab, or an emulated instance thereof. And counting evolution, there were only... There's 14 billion of them, I said. That's not 20% more broken. That's the Infocalypse! You meat sacks are so easily impressed by zeros. The important number isn't how many 32-bit instances of Unix are in operation today. It's not even how many vulnerable ones there are. It's how much damage all those vulnerable ones will cause when they go bluey. And I'm betting, not much. It will be, how do you say, meh? My grandfather remembered installing the systems that caused the Y2K system. My dad remembered the birth of meh. I remember the rise and fall of anyone caring about AI. Technology is glorious. But okay, stipulate that you're right and lots of important things go bluey on September 30th. You may not get accurate weather reports. The economy might bubble a little. Your transport might get stuck. Your pay might land in your bank at daylight. And he had me there. It would be terrible. You know what I think? I think you want it to be terrible. You want to live in the important epoch in which it all changes. You want to know that something significant happened on your watch. You don't want to live in one of those unimportant epochs in which it all stayed the same and nothing much happened. Being alive in the epoch in which AI became reality doesn't cut the mustard, apparently. I squirmed in my seat. That morning, my boss, Peyton Moldovan, had called me into her office. 
a beautifully restored temporary habitat dating back to the big L.A. floods when this whole plot of land had been a giant and notorious refugee camp. Sun Oracle had gotten it for cheap and located its institute there on the promise that they preserve the hastily thrown up structures where so many had despaired. I sat on a cushion on the smooth cement floor. The structures had been delivered as double-walled bags full of cement mix, only needing to be inflated with high-pressure water to turn them into big, dome-shaped, sterile cement yurts. Odell, she said, I've been reviewing our budget for the next three quarters, and the fact of the matter is, there's no room in it for Big Mac. I put on my best smooth, cool, professional face. I see, I said. Now, you've still got a job, of course. Plenty of places for a utility infielder like yourself here. Tell the truth, most labs are begging for decent admins to keep things running. But Big Mac just isn't a good use of the Institute's resources. The project hasn't produced a paper or even a press mention in over a year, and there's no reason to believe that it ever will. AI is just... boring, I thought, but I didn't say it. The B word was banned in the Big Mac Center. What about the researchers? She shrugged. What researchers? Palin Chiuk has been lab head pro tem for 16 months, and she's going on maternity leave next week, and there's no one in line to be pro tem pro tem. Her grad students would like to work on something meaningful like Beinenbaum's lab. That was the new effective computing lab, in which they were building computers that simulated emotions so that their owners would feel better about their mistakes. Big Mac had emotions, but they weren't the kind of emotions that made his mistakes easier to handle. The key here was simulated emotions. Effective computing had taken a huge upswing ever since they'd thrown out the fMRIs and stopped pretending that they could peer into the human mind in real time and draw meaningful conclusions from it. She had been sitting cross-legged across from me on an embroidered Turkish pillow. Now she uncrossed and recrossed her legs in the other direction and arched her back. Look, Odell, you know how much we value you. I held up my hand. I know. It's not that. It's Big Mac. I just can't help but feel... He's not a person. He's just a clever machine that's good at acting person-like. I think you just described me and everyone I know, present company included. One of the long-standing benefits to being a sysadmin is that you get to act like a holy fool and speak truth to power and wear dirty t-shirts with obscure slogans because you know all the passwords and have full access to everyone's clickstream and IM logs. I gave her the traditional rascally sysadmin grin and wink to let her know that it was ha-ha only serious. She gave me a weak, quick grin back. Nevertheless, the fact remains that Big Mac is a piece of software owned by Sun Oracle, and that software is running on hardware that is likewise owned by Sun Oracle. Big Mac has no legal or moral right to exist. That's uh, 4.30. Ladies and gentlemen, my cuckoo clock. Big Mac has no moral or legal right to exist, and shortly, it will not. He had become it, I noticed. I thought about Goering's use of dehumanization as a tool to abet murder. Having violated Godwin's law, as an argument grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one, the party making the comparison has lost the argument. I realized that I had lost the argument, and so I shrugged. As you say, milady. Dad taught me that one. When in doubt, bust out the Renfair talk, and the conversation will draw to a graceful close. She recrossed her legs again and rolled her neck from side to side. Thank you. Of course, we'll archive it. It would be silly not to. I counted to five in Esperanto, Grandad's trick for inner peace, and said, I don't think that will work. He's emergent, remember? Self-assembled? A function of the complexity of the interconnectedness of the computers? I was quoting from the plaque next to the picture window that opened up into the cold room that housed Big Mac. I saw it every time I coughed into the lock set into the security door. She made a comical face palm and said, Yeah, of course. But we can archive something, right? It's not like it takes up a lot of actual bytes, right? A couple of exos, I said. Sure, I could flip that up into our research net store. That was mirrored across many institutions and striped with parity and error checking to make it redundant and safe but I'm not going to capture the state information. I could try to capture RAM dumps from all his components, you know, like getting the chemical state of all your neurons. And then I could also get the topology of his servers. Prepus did that a couple of years ago, when it was clear that Big Mac was solving the hard AI problems. Thought he could emulate him on modern hardware. Didn't work, though. No one ever figured out why. 
Prepus thought he was the Roger Penrose of AI, that he discovered the ineffable stuff of consciousness on those old rack-mounted servers. You don't think he did? I shook my head. I have a theory. All right, tell me. I shrugged. I'm not a computer scientist, you understand, but we've seen this kind of thing before in self-modifying systems. They become dependent on tiny variables that you can never find, optimized for weird stuff like the fact that one rack has a crappy power supply that surges across the backplane at regular intervals, and that somehow gets integrated into the computational model. Who knows? Those old Intel 8 cores are freaky. Lots of quantum tunneling at that scale, and they had bad QA on some batches. Maybe he's doing something spooky in quantum, but that doesn't mean he's some kind of Penrose proof. She pooched her lower lip out and rocked her head from side to side. So you're saying that the only way to archive Big Mac is to keep it running as is in the same room with the same hardware. Dunno. Literally. I don't know which parts are critical and which ones aren't. I know Big Mac has done a lot of work on it. Big Mac has? He keeps on submitting papers about himself to peer-reviewed journals, but he hasn't had one accepted yet. He's not a very good writer. So he's not really an AI? I wondered if Peyton had ever had a conversation with Big Mac. I counted backwards from five in Lodgeland. No, he's a real AI who sucks at writing. Most people do. Peyton wasn't listening anymore. Something in her personal workspace had commanded her attention, and her eyes were focused on the virtual displays that only she could see, cicading as she read while pretending to listen to me. Okay, I'm just going to go away now, I said. Milady, I added when she looked sharply at me. She looked back at her virtual display. You've been listening to the Cory Doctor podcast, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike US 3.0. Or as Woody Guthrie put it in another context, this song is copyrighted in the US under seal of copyright 154085 for a period of 28 years, and anyone caught singing it without our permission will be a mighty good friend of ours, because we don't give a dern. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it, we wrote it, that's all we wanted to do. Many thanks to John Taylor Williams for mastering. That's Rynex Studio, W-R-Y-N-E-C-K Studio at gmail.com. John Taylor Williams is a full-time self-employed audio engineer, producer, composer, and sound designer. In his free time, he makes beer, jewelry, odd musical instruments, and furniture. He likes to meditate, to read, and to cook. Talk to you next week.